Tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how God reveals things to us. Um, you know, sometimes we, we go along in life, we, uh, we face challenges, we, we seem to have trouble with situations, we seem to have trouble with people, uh, you know, we're going to church, but, but there's something inside of us, we want more, we feel like, you know, we, we need more. You know, and I remember there was a time, if you want to turn to uh, Luke 17, you can, you don't have to go there, but, but there was a time when the disciples told Jesus, they said to him, increase our faith. Now, we remember that. You remember seeing that in the Word? You remember that? Do you remember the context of what was going on when they said it? No, probably not, because here's the deal. We all react to that increase our faith because we're like, God, increase my faith. You know, I understand. We, we read that and we think, I know why the disciples said that. I know why, because, you know, but, but if you're looking there in, in Luke 17, Jesus in verse mm, 1 was talking about stumbling blocks, and, and a stumbling block is a person, if you keep reading that, because uh, verse 2 says it would be better for him if a millstone were, but anyway, see that? So, so he's talking about a people who are stumbling blocks, and then he starts talking about people who have uh, not done the right thing, people who have wronged us sinned against us. I don't know what happened. You know, I don't know if there was some situation that led up to this and the disciples were, were like struggling with something. And, and Jesus was like, you know, woe to the one who causes the stumble. But, but then he starts talking about forgiveness there. And, and, and he says, you know, even if, they, uh, even if someone sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times and says, I repent, forgive him. And then the disciples I don't know what had happened, if anything, but the disciples were like, oh boy, increase our faith. Because, you know, maybe they were upset about something. Maybe they were mad about something. And, and Jesus is like, even if they come, you know, sin seven times against you in one day, forgive them seven times if they come and ask. And the disciples are like, increase our faith. Well, you know, we get in a place in life and we want, we want more. We want to overcome. We want more faith. We want to take hold of the abundant life that God promises. And, and we know that faith comes by hearing, don't we? If you've been in this church longer than like one time, you've probably heard that. All right. We know faith comes by hearing out of Romans 10. But sometimes we feel like, don't we, that we're not keeping up. We're lagging behind. We're out of step. Not hitting on all the cylinders like we're missing something. Again, just keep looking at me. Don't look around. No one will know that you feel that way sometimes. Um, see, see, somebody recently I was talking to, and, and, and they said to me something like this, I'm just missing a piece. If I could just find that piece and figure that out, I could get all this to work. It's like, really? Okay, well, if you find the piece, let me know how that is. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, it's the love chapter, but at the end of that, you know, Paul starts talking about some other things besides love. But one of the things he says in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Well, when are we going to see face to face with Jesus? Tomorrow? Yesterday? No, probably not. Uh, most of us have not seen Jesus personally. Probably none of us have seen. You may have had a vision or a dream or something of Jesus. I've met several people who have had that, but, but none of us have actually been face-to-face -face with him. We're not going to be face-to-face -face with him till heaven, right? So, so he's talking about the, the difference between now and heaven, right? So, so he says here, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face-to-face. -face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. You see, See, right now, Paul's saying we don't know everything. Did you know that you don't know everything? Do you see from that verse that it is a hopeless case for you to know everything before heaven? Do you see that? Do you see that? Okay, if the Apostle Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, said he's not going to know everything till heaven, neither are you, okay? I don't care how much you study the Word. I don't care how much time you spend with God. You know, don't be discouraged by that. Be encouraged by that because... Paul said, right now we see dimly, as in a mirror. Now, you understand they didn't have mirrors like we have. 
you know, they had a glass that had maybe a little bit of shiny something and they could sort of kind of see themselves in it back then. But we have really good mirrors. We can see a lot better, but still, the point is, is that you're not going to know everything. You're not going to understand everything. You know, you're going to have to learn to live with having some unanswered questions. Hello. You know what I'm talking about? But on, on the other hand, God wants you to get to know him. That was Paul's desire, wasn't it? We, we, I, think I, I think I quote that every time I speak. <laughs> Philippians 3. You know, Paul, Paul says, I count all things as a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And, and then he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his, of his sufferings. You know, he, 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 he wants, that's his burning desire was to know God. It was the most important thing. It, it wasn't his education, which was impressive. It wasn't his upbringing, which was impressive. He grew up in the right side of the tracks. Some of us didn't. Paul did. He grew up in, 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 with money and in a, in a high in society of his day. But, but he says, I count that all as rubbish. Actually, the word is stronger than rubbish. He says, I count it all as complete refuse, as manure. It means nothing. It's pointless and valueless compared to knowing God. He doesn't care about anything but knowing God. To get that point, to get to that point where, where he was, when God would reveal something to him, when God would show him something, he was so thrilled, he didn't know what to do with himself. Now, now I want you, to, we're, we're going to talk about what that is, but, but see, here's the deal. Turn over to John chapter 14, because God has really good news for us in John chapter 14. Because Paul's desire was to know him, to know God to know how God thinks, to know how God operates, to know how God influences his life, all right? And, and, and every one of us in this room has a cry in our heart that, that we want that too. Now, sometimes we can get jaded and we can get cynical and we can get whatever, but that has nothing to do with that deep down in our heart. That's there. That's real. That's not going away either, by the way, because we were made to want God. We were made to want to know him, to have a relationship with him, to walk with him, just like Adam and Eve did. <clears throat> John chapter 14, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. See, there's hope for us because not, you know, our desire is to know him. His desire, do you see that there, is to disclose himself to us. So that's good. See, both sides are working and doing their part and complementing each other. Okay? See how that works? God wants to disclose himself to you. Jesus wants to disclose himself to you. He'll do it. Now, there were some conditions in that verse. Do you see that up there? Okay. He who has my commandments. Do you have his commandments? What's his commandment? To love. All right. Are we perfect at that? No, but you know what? You can fix that real fast. Say, you know, 1 John 1, 9, God, I'm sorry. I didn't walk in love toward Pastor Edwin today. I did, but we're just using him as an example because he doesn't mind if I use him as an example. I, did, I didn't walk in, past, in, in love toward Pastor Edwin today. Please forgive me. If I need to patch that up with him, I'll patch it up with him. And, and then we move on and it's over. See, because it says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all, you get that word in there, all, all unrighteousness. So see, he's taking care of it. See, all you have to do is confess it, and then he takes care of the rest. Okay? So, so Jesus said here, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. You love him? 
Anybody in the room trying really, really hard not to walk in love at all? I don't see any hands. See, we're not doing that, right? Yeah, but you, you know, yeah, but I fail all the time. Okay, well, get over yourself and stop failing all the time and get to know God a little better. And you know what? He, he'll meet you right where you're at. He's not expecting 100%. You understand that? He, he's not going to wait. That, it's just like, you know, do you know those people who say, well, I'll get saved, I'll get my life straightened out, and then I'll, ask, then I'll get saved. No, that's not how that works. It's the other way around, right? We get saved, and then he starts working, right? Right? So the same thing's true here. He'll meet you right where you're at. If you're not walking in love real well, well, just, you know, start making some steps in that direction, and, and he'll meet you right there. And, and so you're there. And, and so... So it says here, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. He wants, to, he wants you to know him. He, he wants you to know that, that he loves you. He, he wants you to know that, that he has a sense of humor. He, he wants you to know that he cares about stupid little things that you don't think he actually cares about. I was, uh, I was shopping the other day for, for something, and, and uh, I, was, I was looking in the department that I thought it would be in, and, and right here. Go to the children's department. I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. It wouldn't be there. So I ignored that, and then I went to another department and was looking, and right here, go to the children's department. It'll be there. So I went to the children's department, and hanging right there on this rack was what I was looking for, which still doesn't make sense, but it was there, but it was there. <laughs> see, he knew that. See, he's smarter than we are. And see, 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 he cares about the stupid little things that you don't think he cares about. But see, if you'll... Get a heart desire like Paul did. You don't even have to be as much as Paul. Just, just take a few little steps in that direction. He'll start disclosing himself to you, and you're going to find out who he is. <laughs> Do you know, you know there's twice that Jesus broke bread and fish and fed the, the, the thousands of people, right? And, and the first time it says, anybody know, how many baskets of food were left over? Twelve, Twelve the first time. And the second time, anybody know how many were left over? Seven. Yeah, it's either five or seven. I think it's seven. Anyway, I, I was reading through whatever gospel both of them are in, and, and I, I read, I had read, this was years ago. I was just in my 20s, you know. I was, like, you know, young, like Pastor Mark. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I read the second one where there were five baskets, and, and the Lord just spoke to me, and he goes, yeah, I got more efficient. But, but see, see, you think, see, people don't know. I mean, he's just funny. You know, he's just kind of funny, actually. He has a funny sense of humor. He knew I would think that was really, really funny. He knew I would think that was funny. Years ago, I had a, a client who would always say, it's going to be a big day. It's going to be a big week. It's going to be a big month. You know, just he always, he always said he was just a great big guy, and he just liked to laugh, and he was a real positive person. Going to be a big day. We can't wait. You know, he was always big everything. And, uh, and the, when, before I went on staff at Rama, uh on a Monday, the Lord spoke to me and, and said, <laughs> he's so funny. You just have to get to, see, see, he wants to reveal himself to you. He wants you to just walk with him. We got to turn to something in a minute, but but you know, so so it was on a Monday, and the Lord spoke to me. He goes, "Yeah, it's going to be a big week. I want you to fast." And I thought, you know, I laughed because he's just funny. You know, it's going to be a big week, really, Lord, <laughs> really. And, and and I did what he. I knew what he wanted me to do, so I fasted. You know, and. And, and then, you know, your head starts going, right, sometimes, because he says stuff, and you go, mm, is that big good week, big bad week? <laughs> what is that exactly, Lord? But they, they called me on Thursday and offered me the job of the children's pastor down there. So, so you know, it was going to be a big week for me, and that was a big, you know, a big turning point for me. But you see what I'm saying? See, he, he wants, he wants 
to get to know you. He wants to just walk this thing out with you. You know, when you open up the Word and you read something and something just, you know, it just ministers to you. It's just that verse you were looking for. Just that thing you were looking It doesn't happen every time that I open up the Word. Maybe it does for you, but it doesn't happen for me every time I open up the Word. But, but sometimes when I open up the Word and I read something, it's like, it's just so much life, you know? It's that rhema word. It's like, oh, that's what I needed. See, that's him. That's him talking to you. That's him showing you stuff. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to disclose himself to you. You understand that's just a walk for the two of you. You get that? In, in uh, I'm way, way, way out of my notes here. Genesis chapter 6. absolutely no idea and I don't have it underlined it's okay though Genesis chapter 6 it's talking about actually Genesis 5 forgive me back up one chapter it's talking about Enoch and and we know this you know uh, verse uh, 24 the Bible says that Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him you know but but I want you to I want you to think about this for a minute you know, Enoch is the only person that, the, up to that point, I mean, well, I, let me back up. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden every night, didn't they? But he's the only person after Adam until his point that it says he walked with God. Well, what does that mean? It means just what we're talking about. It means he walked with God. He hung out with God. God was his friend. And God had so much fun with him and loved him so much that he just took him and he just went to heaven. One of, there's just a handful of people who didn't die in the Bible. Enoch's one of them. Elijah's another one. But, but back up to, uh, back up to verse 21, and it says this, Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah, who, by the way, was the person who lived on the earth the longest, Verse 22, look at this. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years. He walked with God 300 years. Isn't that awesome? I just love that. I just love that. It just cheers me up just thinking about somebody walking with God for 300 years. Now, nowadays, nobody lives 300 years. But, but back then, they lived longer. And Enoch, you know, the, the Bible talks about the days of Noah Actually, Enoch was right before the days of Noah, and the wickedness of the earth was increasing and increasing and increasing. But, but, but Enoch was that salmon going the other direction from the current. You know what I'm saying? The, the current was going this way toward more and more wickedness, and Enoch was walking with God, going this way, having the time of his life, had so much fun. God probably was looking out there going, it's getting real ugly down there. I'm just going to take you out of here. You know, sounds like the rapture, doesn't it? I don't know. Anyway, Enoch walked with God. I love that. You know, God just wants to disclose himself to you. Turn over to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to take another look at Paul's life here. You guys doing all right tonight? All right. Galatians 1, verse 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You see that? Now, you understand that Paul didn't have a Bible. They had the Old Testament scrolls. He may or might not have had a lot of access to all of that, but, but Paul... Didn't, they didn't have the Gospels even. Paul didn't ca have a Bible that he could carry around or a scroll he could carry around. And, and so God, when he got saved, took him out to the desert, the Bible says, and taught him. Now, wouldn't that have been fun? Wouldn't you just have loved to have been there while Paul was having that communing time and that time where God was just disclosing himself to Paul. But, but that's what happened. Somebody, God had to have somebody do that, didn't he? So he picked a super educated guy who was out persecuting the church and killing Christians and, and, and spoke to him from heaven. Disclosure one. And Paul went a complete 180, didn't he? Went the other direction. He's like, all right. So he went from 
giving everything he had to killing Christians to giving everything he can to making more Christians. And, and, and God revealed himself through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if we skip ahead... Skip to verse 15, because he's talking about his history. Well, let's, let's go back to 13. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Zealous meaning I was killing people. Yes, verse 15. But when God who set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, look at this, look at this, look at this, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Do you see that? That I might. We'll stop with the that I might. You know what? God is pleased to reveal his son in you. It pleases him to do that. It gives him pleasure. He's excited about it. Every time that you're walking with God, every time you're taking time with the Lord, every time you're praying or praying in tongues or whatever you're doing, and, and, and God is right there walking with you, and he decides to reveal himself to you something. That may not be what you were hoping he would reveal. Yeah, have you ever been there? God, I really want you to talk to me about this. Yeah, he doesn't. He might. He might when he does, but see, he's, what he's going to talk to you about is the most important thing, not the thing that you think is most important, because he's smarter than you are. He's smarter than I am. He's going to talk to you about the most important thing that you need. Or he might just talk to you just a little bit of an I love you like it's in the children's department, not the department you're wasting your time looking in. See, he's done that to me lots of Has he ever done stuff like that for you? I, I know I'm not the only one. See, I was... I was, trying to, I was trying to find some styrofoam gliders one day for a children's event, and, and, and the Lord told me to go to Michael's, but I don't like that store, so I wasn't going to go there, and I went to like four other stores. <laughs> Finally, I went into Michael's, and right there in the aisle, like, you know, like right there, you couldn't do anything but trip over them, <laughs> were styrofoam gliders. See, I can be real hard-headed. Hopefully, you're not as hard-headed as I am. God is pleased. He's excited to reveal himself to you. See, see, sometimes he feels so far away, but you know what? You know, Paul said that, didn't he? He said, but, but he, he, was, he was, you know, when he, was, when he said, in him we live and move and have our being, that's what he said to him before that. He goes, you know, basically was sometimes, you know, he seems, God seems so far away from us. But in fact, in him we live and move and have our being. See, we think it's the other way around. See, because it, it's easier for us to think about that. We ask Jesus, I ask Jesus into my heart, and he's in me. Yeah, no, that's not how God sees it, according to the word. Now, it's true, he is in us, but that's not how he sees it, because it says, in him we live and move and have our being. See, see, he sees us being a part of him now. Do you see that? I'm not saying it's wrong to say the other, but he sees us as being part of him. Does that make sense? So, so he wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to show himself to you. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29, you don't have to turn there. It says the secret thing belongs to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and our sons forever. See, now that you're not going to know everything. Through this glass, we see dimly now. We're not going to know everything till we're there. But there are secret things. There are things that, that we're, we're not going to know. Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians, when he was talking about, I know a man who went to heaven, whether in the body or, or not in the body, I don't know. But he saw things that man is not permitted to tell. Do you, you remember that? But see, there's secret things. There's things that, that God might tell Brent and not me. It's none of my business. Okay, Some of the things God's told me, they're none of your business. You see what I'm talking about? But see, the secret thing, that's God's. We don't worry about that. But that which is revealed belongs to us and our children forever. See, see, God wants to reveal himself. See this? This book here. He has revealed himself. And, 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 and when God speaks something to us in our hearts, okay, if it doesn't line up with this, it wasn't God. Okay, because he'll never contradict himself ever. 
You know, people, people have gotten off, they've gotten wacky because they decided, you know, somebody told the pastor one time, oh, I'm way beyond that thing. <sighs> yeah, well, they're so far beyond, they're, they're, yeah, I don't have any time for that. You know, especially somebody who'd say something like that about the Word of God, you know they're in bad, bad, bad shape. But you know what? We, we don't go beyond that. If it doesn't line up with that, I'm not interested. But God wants to reveal himself to you. He wants you to know him. And someday we will know him like he knows us. But right now, it's, it's an exciting thing that we get to do on this, in this world, on this earth. Amen? Turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Um, We usually go to, you know, lots of times people quote the very end of that chapter, but we're going to back up a little bit. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. All things, do you see that? How many things? All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Do you see that? Is that pretty awesome? Well, well how, how do you get to a place where he wills to reveal him to you? Well, you're one of his kids, all right? If, if, you have, uh, if you're part of God's family, if you have received Jesus into your life, then, then it's his will. Amen? If, if you're not, if you haven't done that, then, then you're not going to get a revelation of him like you would like to have. You know, some people, well, yeah, there might be truth there, but there's truth in other places. No, no. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? That's, that's, why, that's, why, that's why, you know, that's why previous to this verse in, uh, in verse... 25 it says you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent you know people who think they're wise people who think they're intelligent who think they know more than the word of god they think they know more than the people sitting in this building see see they're they're out there and and god said i've revealed them to infants well what does that mean does that mean that you know that that micah knows more than we do no 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 he's not talking about that is he He's not talking about that. You know, he, he's talking about childlike faith. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we, have to, we have to keep ourselves from getting jaded. This world is, a, is an ugly place sometimes. There's things that go on, and, and there's things that go on in politics, and there's things that go on in our jobs and in situations in our families, and we can get frustrated, and we can, we can be angry about things, and, and we can be distracted from what's really important. I, 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 I've had to catch myself recently be, because, because we, can get, we can get thinking about stuff and, and, and there's no value in it. It, it hurts our walk with the Lord. It, it, it hurts our relationships because we're frustrated and we're, we're, we're angry about things that go on in the world. You know, Paul kept himself, you know, he, he told Timothy, he said, you know, keep yourself from the world. Now, that doesn't mean you don't live in the world, you know, because you, we, we live in the world. But, but he, you know, he's like, don't, don't, don't get all involved in everything that's going on. You just do what God says. Now, he may have you get involved. There's, there's some wonderful Christian people in politics. There's some wonderful Christian people in Hollywood. There's some wonderful Christian people in places that I wouldn't want to be. OK, but and, and God may do that. But you know what? You know, I, I know people who, you know, they they go to the store and buy every magazine like the National Enquirer and, you know, read it like it's the Bible. And I'm thinking, no, it's probably probably better put that in the bottom of the birdcage. But uh, anyway, um, did I say that out loud? I probably shouldn't have um, childlike faith. You know, God wants us to have childlike faith. We, we know what that's like, but, you know, he, he wants us to trust him. But it's easy, it's easy for a kid, they just trust. 
And he, and he wants us to be hopeful and honest. You know, he already knows, so you might as well just tell him, right? Just talk to him. That's what God wants. My wife says that all the time. God just wants to talk to you. He just wants to talk to you. He just wants to be with you. He just loves you. He wants to reveal himself to you. So, you know, just a child's content when their basic needs are met. You know that? If they're not met, they may be something less than content. Um, there's no screaming in here tonight, though, so we're good. But, uh, you know, a child's humble and they're enthusiastic, you know. All you have to do is get in their face and smile and they smile back. Or they might cry if you're me. Sometimes kids, I don't know what that's about. But, you know, we, 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 uh, you know, Jesus said if we humble ourselves as a child, then we're the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, a, a, a child is, is humble. They, they're not born with a contract in their hand. You will feed me X times per day. You will hold me X hours per day. You will give me X hours of lap time per day. I will get X hours of time with grandma each week. I will be allowed to sleep X hours per day. I will have a full toy box with fewer than 50% of so-called educational toys signed here. It doesn't say that. That didn't happen. No child comes with a contract. All right? No, we just trust him. We, 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 he wants us to just have that childlike faith and not just, you know, if, if, if all we pay attention to is, is what's going on in the world, we're going to get jaded. We're going to get frustrated. And, and it's not that you don't keep track of anything that's going on. Although some people have, like Smith Wigglesworth, he wouldn't read a newspaper. If somebody brought him one, he'd throw it away. He didn't want to know. He just didn't want to know what was going on. All he cared about what was going on in God's world. All right? What's going on in the church? That's what he cared about, and that's fine. Uh, you know, but, but the point is, is that, that as we come to him in humility... He's going to reveal himself to us. Amen? Are you still in Matthew? Are we still in Matthew? Verse 27 again, one more time. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then Jesus said, look at 28, come to me. We read this a lot, but I love this. All who are weary... And heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Do you see that? Do you see that part where he says, learn from me? Do you see that? See, he wants to have that walk with you. Just the two of you. You and him. You're probably not going to get a walk with him on this earth like Enoch did for 300 years, okay? All right. Do you remember, uh, you remember Samuel in the Old Testament? It, you don't have to turn there. Let's just talk about it for a minute. His mother was not able to have children. Her name was Hannah. And uh, she, uh, she went up to Shiloh. The tabernacle was at Shiloh. Joshua actually moved the tabernacle to Shiloh. So if, if you found that, you could, you could go back into the book of Joshua and see that. So Hannah and her husband, Elkanah, they, they went up to the tabernacle every year. And Hannah was, uh, uh-oh. Um, Hannah was, uh, Elkanah actually had two wives, which wasn't uncommon in that day, and uh, one of them, she had a number of children, and Hannah had no children, and the other one, the other wife would goad her about it and mock her because she had no children, and Hannah went to the, before the Lord, and she poured out her heart before the Lord and, and, and asked the Lord for a child, and she said to the Lord, if you give me a child, I will dedicate him to your service for his whole life. And so uh, the, the, the priest, Eli, uh, talked to her and told her that, uh, you know, he blessed her. And, and a year later, she had a child. And I think he was about four um, when uh, Hannah brought him up to Shiloh and left him with the priest, so that he would live at the temple and serve, uh, serve the priests and serve uh, the, 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 the people of Israel. And, and uh, well, actually, turn over there. Turn over to 1 Samuel 3.19. Okay. 
But yeah, so Samuel uh, was there, and at some point, you recall that Samuel was was laying in bed, and uh, and and he was not uh, he was near the priest Eli, but not right there, and so, and he heard Samuel Samuel, so he ran. He got up out of bed and ran to the priest and said, yes, Eli, what do you want? Because he was a servant. He had a servant's heart. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. And he was laying there, and he heard it again, Samuel, Samuel. So he jumped up, and he ran to Eli, and he said, yes, Eli, what do you want? And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And the third time, Samuel, Samuel, and he ran to Eli, and Eli realized that it was the word of the Lord. It was God revealing himself to little Samuel. And so he said to him, he said, next time when the Lord speaks Samuel, Samuel, you say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so Samuel went back to bed and, uh, and, uh, and he said, and, and God said again, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, and that was when the Lord started revealing himself. And for so Samuel's whole life, the Lord revealed himself to him, and he led Israel. And, but, but I want you to, to look at this verse here, 19, because, because it says a whole lot about Samuel's heart. It says here, look at this, it says, Thus Samuel grew... And the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. Now, there's, the translators have, have uh, had some disagreement about the translation of this passage, all right? So some s translators have suggested that it means that God did not let his own words fail. Actually, the, the, the literal Hebrew says his words fall to the ground. He didn't let his words fall to the ground. But we know that God's words never fall to the ground. The word is alive. The word is is everlasting. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. So, and we also know, you know, from the word that, that it says God's words never return to him void. So, so it can't be talking about that. It can't mean that. So, so I, I, I put it up to you that, that the remarkable thing here is that Samuel did not lose, drop, or forget any of the words that the Lord gave to him. Now think about that. That is amazing, okay? You know, we, we can, uh, you know, the, the, the word says that we need to be doers of the word and not hearers only, because if we just let it go in one ear and out the other, we're not doing very well, and we're, we're not following the plan that God has for us. But Samuel, Samuel had this amazing heart. That's why God put him in charge of the whole country. That's why he led all of Israel until they had a king. Because Samuel had this amazing heart. Whatever God said to him, he held on to it. He didn't let one word that God spoke to him fall to the ground. In other words, he didn't forget about any of them. He didn't let any of them go. He probably wrote them all down and made sure he went and checked on them every now and then. To make sure he was keeping up with what was going on. See, that's how David was, isn't it? David, what did he say? In, in Psalm 119, maybe 10, uh, it says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I would not sin against you. Actually, better than hidden is treasured. Thy word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. But, but you know, it isn't just that. David just loved God. David just loved God and, and, and spent hours out in the, you know, from the time he was a young boy out with the sheep. He'd, he'd write psalms, and, and many, many of his psalms, I mean, he, was, he, was he hearing from God? Yeah, because a lot of his psalms were prophetic. His psalms talk about the Messiah, talked about the suffering of Jesus, and many of the things that David wrote down were things that happened to Jesus, exactly, you know, but, but, but David treasured the Word of God. He treasured the law. He treasured those things. You know, and, and it, it, it gave him life. You know, I think we, we don't realize that, that the Word, the Word is going to give us life. The Word is going to give us uh, encouragement. In, in Psalm 19, David wrote this, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Now, I want you to think about that. You know, we think about law being drudgery and... Uh, 
But so, you know, but, but we think of law and rules as drudgery, you know. I mean, you know, songs have been dedicated to, you know, you know, rules at school and, you know, all these things, you know. So, so you know, we think of rules as drudgery, but let's think about, you know, David got it. See, he, he got it. He, he saw that, that, that the laws that God gave, and, and even the law of love is in the Old Testament, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Love your neighbors yourself. You know, Jesus, one of the Pharisees came to Jesus, and, and Jesus said, you've done good. You're close to the kingdom of God if you figured, if you picked those two out as being the ones that are most important, because then, then later, Jesus said to his disciples, the law is summed up in this, right? That, that we love God and that we love each other. And then he said, a new, a new commandment I give you, one commandment he gave us. So, so when we think about that, you know, we can, we can put that in here, the, the commandment of love, the, 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 the commandment to love is perfect, refreshing the soul. Have you ever loved somebody that didn't deserve it? You just, that love inside of you, you just let it well up inside of you and you went ahead and loved them even though they didn't deserve it? How do you feel after you do that? You feel great. If you'll just let yourself do it, you'll feel great inside because it's like there's just something about loving, you know, there's just something about doing something, you know, where the, you know, there's a, a verse that says, you know, if, if you, you know, if you do good things to somebody who's done evil things to you, it's like heaping coals on them. But, but, but the thing is, is that, that when you walk in love towards somebody who hasn't been loving to you, it's just this awesome thing. Why? Because you're doing what God does. You're lining up to you. He made you in his image. And I'm telling you, there's life in that. So Psalm 19, you know, he says, the law of the Lord, the law of love is perfect, refreshing the soul. The law of love, we're just substituting, is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The law of the Lord, the law of love is right, giving joy to the heart. The law of the Lord is radiant, giving light to the eyes. The, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Back to the law of love is firm and righteous. I mean, I'm telling you, David got excited about it. Why? Because he saw it worked. He saw that walking with God and walking in the revelation that God gave him put him at the head and not the tail. You know, he was the youngest kid. He got the bad job taking care of the sheep. But when Samuel came and, and God said, go anoint one of the sons of Jesse as king, and, and, you know, Samuel saw the tall, handsome one and said, that's the guy. And God goes, no, I look at their heart. He ain't it. And, and down the line, boom, 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 all of them till the end. And, and, and God said no to all, I think, what are there, nine? I think nine. He said no to the eight that were there. And, and Samuel's like, I have no God's voice. See, Samuel walked with that. He, God revealed himself to him. Samuel walked with God. He knew. God said, one of his sons. So he looks at Jesse and goes, okay, you were supposed to bring all your sons. Do you have another one? Oh, yeah, the young ones out with the sheep. Go get him. See, see God just looks at your heart. That part of your heart that's calling out to him, that wants to know him, that wants more of him that wants more faith, like the disciples said. See, see, he gets that. He, he loves that about you. He loves that part of you. When you let that part of you motivate you and get you into the word and get you to praying and get you to helping people and blessing people and walking in love, see, God gets excited about that. And there's life in that and there's joy in that because you're doing what he does. You know, he says, it, you know, the word says God reigns on the just and the unjust. See, he, he doesn't, See, if it just rained at my yard and all my other, my neighbors, you know, their yards were burning up and, you know, the grass was brown. <laughs> but see, that, that's not how God does it. See, he just is a, he's a loving God. He wants to reveal himself to everyone. Everyone, he'll look to him, he'll reveal him. Seek and you shall. See? See, you just take... You don't see you don't have to take big steps. You don't have to you don't have to spend 17 hours a day in the word. One guy told me he goes I prayed 16 hours yesterday and I thought dear lord. 
if that's what it takes, I'm in deep trouble. But you know what? That isn't what it takes, okay? Do, it, it, am I right? See, that, that hunger that, that when you got saved, that revelation of something, there's truth here. I need this. I need this. When you ask Jesus to come into your life, see, that was the beginning of it. That was the beginning of it. That's how it starts. And, and, it, it, and if you'll let it, it'll just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Now, if you're good, you know, some people, they get saved and, oh, well, you know, they just go on down the road. But, but you know what? That isn't where most of us are at. Most of us want more. Most of us want to know him more. Paul certainly did. And what a great example that was. Look, uh, are you in back up to, let's see, John 14. Or move forward. I think you're in Matthew. I don't know. John chapter 14. I'm winding down here. John chapter 14. This is right before Jesus uh, went to the cross. And uh, in, if you have a red letter Bible, you, you're going to see a whole bunch of chapters right there, all in red. Because these were the last words that Jesus gave to the disciples before he died. He knew that after he died, they'd see him, but he wasn't going to get to spend as much time with him. I don't know what he was doing, but he didn't get to spend it. It says he, they saw him hit and miss. But he, this was his last big opportunity to, to tell the disciples the most important things. You know, if, 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 if I told... If somebody told me I was going to die tonight, there'd be a few things that I would want to do or say. And, and these th things uh, are, are the things that Jesus knew were the most important things that they needed to hear before he left. And, and so, verse, uh, let's see, John 14, let's start with verse 16. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, you see there where, where they hadn't been born again yet, right? Because Jesus hadn't died, taken their sins, made that way possible, opened up that way for us to be saved. So he said he he's abides with you, he's on you, but he's going to be in you, right? So, so verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Hmm? He, he just told them he was leaving. And he told them he was going to send the Spirit. Now he's saying, I'm going to come to you by the Spirit. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? So, so he says here, I will not leave you as orphans. See, that's what they're thinking. Jesus said he's leaving. They didn't even hear what he was saying. They're all freaking out because he said he was leaving. And, and he's like, okay, back up. I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm not abandoning you. I am sending the Holy Spirit to abide with you forever. That means even in heaven, the Holy Spirit's going to be abiding with us because forever would include our, our time, all of our time on earth, and then all of our time in heaven. So the Holy Spirit's going to be with us forever, right? Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. Calm down. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. See, he wants to reveal himself to you. That doesn't mean you're going to see him walk into your room. Some people have seen a vision of Jesus. That probably isn't going to happen to you, but it could. But, but that isn't the point. The point is, is that he's going to reveal himself to you. See, he was telling him, guys, I know I'm leaving. See, can you imagine you imagine three years they were with Jesus nonstop. They were with him nonstop. And all of a sudden he says, I'm leaving. Ah, I'm sure I'd freak out too. But, but the point is, as he said, okay, it's better for you if I leave. You know, if you've seen that passage. He said, it's better for you if, if I leave because I'm going to send the Spirit. The Spirit's going to walk with you. He's going to take the things that are mine See, see, you understand how that works, right? Jesus knows the Father, and the Father's given Jesus everything. We read that. 
And then Jesus gave the spirit things, right, to tell us. So, so see, we have access to all of the information in the universe. Do you see that? Because the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, verse 20, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. See, that's just how it is. You know, we're walking with him. We're in him. He's in us. And uh, we're walking this thing out. He wants to disclose himself to you. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants you to know that everything's going to be okay. That, that uh, whatever you're dealing with is not too big for him to handle. He wants you to know that, that, that he has a sense of humor. That he cares about the little things in your life. That he cares about the big things in your life. But that he's never going to leave you, and he's never going to forsake you, and he's always going to walk with you, and his spirit's going to live with you forever. He's never going to abandon you. That's what he wants you to know. But he doesn't want you to stop there. He wants you to just keep growing and growing in the knowledge of God. You know, one of the things, we won't go there because I need to stop, but one of the things he said as we grow in the knowledge of God, that brings about unity. We don't see a lot of unity. I mean, I think we get along pretty good in our church here. But we don't see a lot of unity in the churches in the world. We don't see a lot of unity in the Christian community. But you know what? As we walk with him, as we uh, spend time with him, as he discloses himself to us, as we realize more and more that we're in him and he's in us and we're walking this thing out, we're going to see greater unity. As we see greater unity, we're going to see revival and we're going to see awesome things happen in the church and in our world and the influence that we have will increase 